All right, ladies and gentlemen, hello. We're here today to do our first poem of the week. This is going to be, um, what I'm going to do is on this assignment in Google Classroom, I will upload to the first poems assignment a copy of the uh, Poetic Lit Terms handout for the week. It will be the unannotated handout. So my expectation is that you'll pull up your copy of this and sort of follow along with me as I go, make the annotations that I make. I understand that this is gonna take a certain amount of pause, flip over, annotate, pause, flip over, annotate. So just, it's totally okay to pause this as much as you want or to just sort of like go to the end of the video and uh, add all the annotations in at once. Um, I'm still gonna be doing a decent amount of analysis, I hope. I would encourage you uh, just to result in the highest possible grade on your quiz, which is gonna be done in a similar fashion where I just upload a copy of the Google Doc of the quiz and then you annotate all you want and answer the questions. Um, to get the highest possible grade on the quiz, I would encourage you to add notes that I don't talk about. I'm going to try to kind of focus on these to keep these videos as short as possible to, on the just terms that we talk about for the week. So I'm not gonna automatically just slap middle diction on this because that's what all of you do because it's the easiest one to do. So if you wanna do that, you can do it yourself. If I don't talk about tone, speaker, mood, all of those terms that we've gone over for the year, my expectation is that you'll still be applying them because when we get to the poetry quiz, that's the way to get the highest possible grade is to make those connections, not just between not just between the text and the terms for the week, but also the text and everything else we've read and the other terms that we've read. So let's start on this. Our poem, our first poem this week is, it's uh, this is for week nine, poem A. It's, it's called A Book. It's by Emily Dickinson. Um, this is... This week, we're gonna be focused on three specific types of figurative language. So we've talked about figurative language in the past, but your figurative language is the, figurative language is language that is not meant to be literally interpreted, right? Language that we interpret not literally on purpose, right? So examples of figurative language that you've talked about in the past, right? Simile, metaphor, personification, um, there's a million of them, but we're gonna to focus today on simile and metaphor. Now I'm aware that if you've been paying attention at all in English class before ninth grade, that these are two terms that you've heard, but I'd like to go into them a little bit deeper, I hope, than you have in the past this um, this week. So, so if we look at our definitions for the week, metaphor is a comparison between do two dissimilar things with the intent of giving added meaning to one of them, and it does not use like or as, right? So the idea is that we compare one thing to another thing in order to illuminate what we mean to say or to show some, to show some product or, uh, characteristic of the thing that we are comparing it to is right so if we say the desert was a sea of sand we don't literally mean that the desert was a big old ocean of water but we are comparing the desert to a sea to evoke the idea of like the vastness of it and how it's easy to get lost in or maybe that it's a little intimidating right so we're sort of we want to connect the connotation of one word to the connotation of the other right we've talked about connotation in the past is is the idea that words have both a dictionary meaning and an emotional meaning. So we use metaphor and simile for that matter to draw connections between those two sets of things, right? The connotation of one word and the connotation of another. His legs were rubber, right? We don't literally mean that his legs were made of rubber. We're saying that they were they would not stand up straight or that they were bendy or that he could not make them like move the way he wanted to, like they weren't a part of him, right? America is a melting pot. Hopefully we don't mean that literally America, well, we don't mean that literally America is a big old pot of soup that has things melting in it or is like a fondue pot or something, right? We mean that America is a place where all of these different people can come together and sort of blend their cultures together into one new culture. And in that sense, we are taking the associations that we have with one thing and we are adding them to the other. So that's what both of these things do. The only difference is that metaphor doesn't use like or as, right? So simile is a comparison between two dissimilar things through the use of like or as, right? We shivered like badly tuned diesel engines. Her skin was as smooth as polished marble. Its claws were sharp like knives. Again, we are associating the connotation of one object thing, whatever, with another object thing, whatever, right? She was like the sun. We don't mean that she was a big old expanding ball of gas that is burning for billions of years. We mean that she provides heat or that she shines in the heavens or that we look up to her or that she gives us life, whatever. We're, we're connecting those connotations when we use both metaphor and simile. Now this third one you might not have heard of, that's implied metaphor. An implied metaphor is a metaphor that's not stated directly. These are a little tricky and we'll be getting into this more in our next poem in poem 9b. Um, but a lot of times an author won't say, won't use that word is or was. They won't use that to be verb that often or were that triggers us to know 
that something is a metaphor, right? So if we say she is the sun, America is a pop, uh, a melting pot, her legs or his legs were rubber. All of those have that to be verb, helping verb kind of into the uh, subject complement that we've talked about from grammar that kind of trigger us to think like, okay, this is a metaphor. Uh, Authors don't always do that because a lot of times it's a little bit more subtle. And this is uh, this first one is kind of a pretty good example of a, an implied metaphor. Um, and we'll talk about kind of like what how that can look in different um, situations as we go through the rest of the this week. So this is a book by Emily Dickinson. So I'm going to read it. I'm going to give you some definitions and then we'll just work through it. So there is no frigate like a book to take us lands away, nor any coursers like a page of prancing poetry. This traverse may the poorest take without a press at all. How frugal is the chariot that bears a human soul? So let's talk about a couple of terms that we might need to know. A frigate is a ship. It's a ship. It's a class of ship, but or a sailing ship usually. But coursers in this instance mean horse, uh, racing horses. Ooh, can't spell horse. That's, that's a problem for an English teacher. Let's see. A traverse is a method of transportation. Oh, let me pause here and talk to you about what I'm doing as I take these comments. So on the page in front of you, if you select a word, you'll see off to the right, a little button will pop up that says add a comment. You can click that and then the comment will come up or you can hit the on Windows, the keys are control alt M will give you a new comment. You can also hit, you can also select a word and hit insert up here and then comment, whoop. So, Let's see, a press is burden or requirement, but I think burden works here. And then frugal is cheap. Um, so if we go through this poem sort of like line by line for meaning here, we can say we have sort of like two paired or two paired couplets of similes, right? There is no frigate like a book to take us lands away. So there's no ship that is like a book to take us far away, right? Um, I would say that in here, we could make an annotation, right? This is a simile, a sim ooh, home keys, my boy. All right, simile comparing books to a ship, right? So then we have another one. Nor any courses like a page of prancing poetry. Oh, that's really good adjective use of usage there with prancing. Right, because we talked about how a simile, right, in this simile, we're we're trying to connect the idea that poetry is like a horse that is free and racing across the land, uh, and we use prancing as an adjective for poetry, which kind of evokes the sort of like uh, freedom or whimsy of a horse. It makes me kind of think about like the dressage, like the horse dancing thing. But we can make a note: you know, simile comparing poetry to horses I spelled horses right right so we have these two similes to start the poem out then we have this traverse made the poorest take without oppressive toll so this is a method of transportation that anybody can take because it's cheap right um there's no real i mean i think that this is an example of an implied metaphor but i actually think that the entire poem is an implied metaphor so we'll address that in a second but just summary wise what we're saying here is that like anyone can read to take right anyone can read to take themselves to new places right uh books are cheap right you can check them out from a library for free you can today i mean she she didn't have this when she didn't have the internet when she wrote this but today you can just get online and read whatever and so the idea that she's getting into is that like even poor people you know even the poorest people can go on a trip when they read i think that's a really cool message too for kind of the times that we're in if you don't know what to do with yourself right now and you're stuck at home and you're driving your parents crazy i would encourage you to read a book or an article or basically anything that's not about the coronavirus the pandemic like I will, if you want to, me to find you a book, I will gladly send you an ebook to read. Do not worry, my dudes. Um, but I think that that's a really powerful idea, right? Like reading takes us to different places, right? W when you read, you're transported to a new world and there's no, it's very egalitarian, which means you can do, anyone can do it, right? You don't have to be rich. You, you might have to be rich to go on 
a trip to Belize. You don't have to be rich to read a book about what it's like to go to Belize, right? And then this is a really, I think, a really nice stinger to the poem here, right? How frugal is the chariot that bears the human soul? It's like this this chair a chariot is like a, a another method of transportation. It's a two wheeled cart. I didn't identify or um, define it because it's not that important. But the idea is that like books, you know, like methods of transportation might transport your body, but books transport your soul. They transport the thing that makes you you. Right? You can get into a car and be asleep. And your body moves around, but your consciousness doesn't really move because you're not awake, right? But anytime you read, you're being taken somewhere else, right? And that's kind of the power of poetry. And that's why we're doing poetry in this class, not just because you're, like, you're required to. Like, I don't care about that. What I care about is that I think that a really powerful tool that we have when we read and when we are doing reading is that we are we can take ourselves to new places. We can free ourselves from sort of the physical bonds of where we are. And I think that's kind of a pretty cool message for like the situation that we all find ourselves in right now. Um, but if we're going to make a note again on the summary here, we could just say, you know, um, reading can take you places. We'll, we'll avoid second person can take people places that physical portation cannot. Okay. So we, you can see in terms of our terms for the week, we have our two, we have a, some similes, we have, um, sort of some summary. And then I think the entire thing here, and I'm just going to make a note right here. I think this entire thing is an implied metaphor, right? Because what are what are we comparing here implicitly, even through the similes? Well, we're comparing reading of books and poetry compared to, I guess we should say transportation, right? It's the idea being that like, books are this thing that can take us away, right? They can bring us to a new place. And so if we think about what is the theme that is presented in this, I think a pretty good theme here is what we just talked about is the like, so if we were going to identify theme, we would say theme. And then, so our theme is like, um, reading can take people to new places regardless of their wealth right so it's a very simple it's very simple sort of like easy universal theme we also might say something like um if we wanted to be a little more abstract we might say reading it uh represents freedom of the soul right like reading doesn't free your body but it does for your soul and i mean if you think about the way I mean, everybody, one of the things that I think you guys are the proudest of is saying that you never read and like, that's BS. Let's be honest. But like, think about when we read Romeo and Juliet or we read the Scarlet Ibis, or if you're in honors, think about when we read Oedipus or when we read the Iliad, it's like, no, even if you hate something, right, no matter you, sort of without helping it, you get pulled into a book, you end up in another place. It's almost like we, we live two realities. We live the reality of sort of ourselves and then also the reality of what we read. And if we expand our definition of reading to include things like video games and movies, like think about the times that you've been pulled into the world of a narrative, right? And that's really what we're doing in this class is we're talking about how those narratives affect us. So I think that this poem has like a really powerful theme. Oh, my name's popped up there. All right, this poem has a really powerful theme for just sort of the way our world works. And I think it's like a really cool message to take away. If we, we always talk in our conclusions of our papers, how we have to have a theme and then we have to say, how do we apply this theme to our lives? And I think this is a really good example of that, right? This is a theme that's really timely. All of us are sort of stuck in our homes right now. So what do we do? Well, a really cool tool to use for that is to read something, to experience a narrative because those narratives are what sort of take us into new places we can never go to. Right, I read so much science fiction, and no matter what happens, I will probably in my lifetime never go to Mars or uh, a colony orbiting Jupiter or whatever. But every time I crack open a science fiction book, I can do that. Right, that's the power of reading is that, you know, no amount of money that I have will get me to Mars right now. But you know, a book that I already own that cost five dollars, I, I can be there for four or five hundred pages. It's a pretty cool message, I think. Anyway, so that is your first poetry lesson. Um, I'm going to give like a five second tag at the end of this of just all of our, I'll center this up so we can see uh, as many of our, I'll leave you a second there. Pause, pause, pause. You can pause here and sort of write down these, make these annotations. Or you can pause here and put these annotations in. Cool. All right. Uh, if you have any questions or comments or concerns, or you need to look at this for some reason, just let me know and send me an email. Thank you guys. Bye.